Welcome to Advanced Patient Care, a podcast by Vance Thompson Vision. Today's podcast is featuring glaucoma, and I'm your show host, John Birdall. I'm here with Lori Provincial, Mike Greenwood, and Justin Schweitzer. This podcast is here to bring you the latest advancements, cutting-edge research, practical tips that you can apply to your clinic practice right away so you can take care of patients the way they deserve to be cared for. So if you're ready to expand your knowledge, stay ahead of the curve, elevate your practice, you are in the right place, and here we go. Um, let me go around the horn. I'm John Birdall. I'm an ophthalmologist do cataract cornea refractive complex IOL at glaucoma here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Mike? Uh, Michael Greenwood, Van Thompson Vision, practice very similar to John up in Fargo, North Dakota. Lori? Lori Proventure. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. I do cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery. And Justin? Uh, Justin Schweitzer, an optometrist. Uh, I work alongside John, managing glaucoma, cataract cornea, and refractive surgery patients. All right. Well, we're going to talk about diagnostics first for about the next 10 minutes or so. So let's start with this. What is glaucoma? Lori, tell us what glaucoma is. Uh, I like to just explain it the way I explain it to patients. I think we all know, but just a nice thing to say is, I just say it's a disease of the optic nerve. I don't talk about pressure necessarily. I just say that little cable that connects your eyeball to your brain has a disease at the nerve head. And the best way that we treat it right now uh, is pressure control. Uh, and I and I say it typically results in visual field loss if left untreated. Great. And, you know, I think the point that you're making there is don't overcomplexify it. It's a serious thing. It's the second leading cause of blindness. But don't overcomplexify it with patients. They What they really want to know is you know what you're doing. You're going to take care of them and you're going to prevent them from going blind. Now, Justin, I'm going to maybe ask you the hardest question of this segment. In the diagnosis of glaucoma, what information do you need? So what I'm really asking for is what do you need in a family history? What do you need in a medication history? What do you need in a past medical history, if anything? And then what diagnostic treatments, uh, what diagnostic tests do you need? And if there isn't, if you miss one, somebody else will pick you up. But let's start with the big picture. What is everything that you need? And then let's dive into the specifics. Yeah, I'll whip through them. But yeah, if I miss something, please jump in. I mean, I want to know family history. Main question I want to know is, did you have a family member go blind from glaucoma? I care about that a little more than if family members had it. Because one is really advanced, one is not so advanced. Uh, you know, when we think about diagnostic tests, uh, obviously want to know what their highest pressure has been in the past. Uh, what their current eye pressure is. We want to get a visual field. We want to get an OCT. We want to know how thick their corneas are. We want to do gonioscopy to see what the angle looks like. Um, so those would be some of the main ones. I want to know if they've been on any previous treatments before. What have they tried from a drop standpoint? Have they had any laser done previously? Uh, have they had any surgeries done that involve glaucoma procedures? Uh, those would probably be the overarching ones. Obviously, we're going to take a look at the nerve and, and see what the cup to disc ratio is. What am I leaving out? Did you say I, OCT? I said OCT. You did say OCT? Okay. Um, good. And then what about corneal hysteresis? Yeah, I missed that one. So I do like that particular one, more for risk assessment, right? Not to diagnose, but I love hysteresis for helpful with risk assessment. How important is having corneal hysteresis as part of the workup? I mean, for me, I don't think I could practice the way I do right now without it. Uh, you know, I think it's a small piece to the puzzle. Uh, all those things I talked about are, are puzzle pieces in diagnosing and managing patients. But I think it can be uh, helpful in deciding between do I just start a drop or do I become more aggressive and recommend a more aggressive surgical procedure along with looking at all the other puzzle pieces as well. Justin, if you're an optometrist in Murdo, South Dakota, do you buy corneal hysteresis? It's not my first thing. I mean, I want an OCT first. I want a visual field. I think those things are more important. Uh, I want to know what corneal thickness is. I think those would be more important than than hysteresis. But if I'm adding to my arsenal of technology for glaucoma, uh, it's it's one on the list. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit more. In order, visual field test, OCT, um, gonioscope, corneal hysteresis. What's my put, top one out of those? Put those four in order. What 
what do you need if you're practicing in rural upper Midwest, which one of those do you buy first? What do you buy second? What do you buy third? What do you buy last? OCT visual field. Gonioscope, then corneal hysteresis? Gonial mirror, then a corneal hysteresis? Oh, yeah, then gonial mirror would be three, then hysteresis four. Okay, good. Laura, do you agree? I'm going to disagree on the top two. I still think I'd buy a field first. And that's because at the end of the day, that's your best reflection of function. And um, it's going to help you decide how worried you really need to be as far as their functioning. Obviously, I rely heavily on OCT and I love corneal hysteresis, but uh, I think when it comes to screening for bad stuff, the field is still would be my preference. Yeah, gotcha. yeah and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge all of them because I would do gonioscopy <laughs> first because if the angle's closed, it's going to dictate how you're going to treat this patient. So uh, regardless of how bad their pressure is. So I'd probably put that one. Sounds great. And that question is kind of like if you were stuck on an island and only could eat one food for the rest of your life, which one would you eat? And so I know it's not a fair question, but I do think it is helpful for us to think about the priority of technology because we're faced with those questions all the time. Justin, you said something that I love about asking the patient, have you had someone go blind from glaucoma? And that the answer to that question puts me down one of two routes. If they say yes, I know that patient's terrified because they watched their mom go blind. And what I like to tell them is, we're not gonna let you go blind from this disease. You're here, assuming it's true and they're not end stage glaucoma, we're gonna almost certainly be able to prevent you from going blind and give them reassurance. However, if the patient says, you know, no, my mom just had glaucoma, they may not be taking their disease as seriously as they should because they don't notice it. And then, so then I kind of take a different approach and say, hey, this is a serious disease. It's the second leading cause of blindness. Our job is to do a great job evaluating you and implementing the right treatments. Your job is to do those treatments or tell us if you can't. And if you can't, we'll find something else that you can do. So I really like how you phrase that question because it puts me down a different road when we're talking with them. Okay, so Mike, uh, you talked about Gonio as your first tool of choice. So let's talk about narrow angle glaucoma for a second. We don't see tons of that up in the upper Midwest, but we see some. What's the treatment for a patient that's got narrow angles? Basically, I'm opening the angle, right? So it's variable. If they're uh, you know, a really young person and they just have a really small eye and then angle's kind of closed, you're going to work at different ways to open that up. You get someone who's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, they still have their natural crystalline lens. Taking out that cataract is going to solve that problem you know, 90% of the time. And that up here is probably what we're seeing most of is more this phacomorphic part where the cataract or their natural lens is causing that narrow angle to form. So to me, removing the, the natural lens. And we'll talk more about that in the therapeutic section. So we'll come back to this question on the what would I do if it was my eye section here coming up. Um, what else are you looking for on that gonio exam, Mike? Uh, am I looking for more on the gonio exam? Is that what you said? Yeah, open or closed. What else are you paying attention to? Uh, so pigmentation is helpful. Um, we're still, you know, we're getting to the point on the diagnostics where we can view the outflow pathway a little bit more. And right now, kind of our poor man's test, so to speak, of what we have is where is the pigment if it's kind of spotty? And so if it's spotty pigmentation, you might say like, okay, that's where uh, the greater outflow pathway is. And so that's maybe where I'm going to make my target when we start, again, talking about therapy or treatment. Um, so those are kind of things, obviously making sure there's no PAS, those types of things that are blocking outflow. If they've had yeah. previous surgery, making yep. sure that exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. I want to add well, a comment to the PAS thing because I'm a huge gonio nerd. So I'm with you, Mike, but like, when it comes to treating angle closure, you're, you, it's really important to stage them properly. So if they're just narrow and they don't have PAS or high pressure yet, it's according to like the ZAP and Analyst trial, it's it's still reasonable to observe those people. Um, you have to have a conversation with the patient about their other risk factors and their lifestyle. 
Um, but once they do start to form PAS, that means that they're getting enough intermittent contact in their angle that they're getting sticky adhesions. And so you have to take their disease more seriously. And that's when they're moving into sort of a different category of treatment, like Mike was talking about, where we're applying the EAGLE trial, where they're either getting an LPI or more likely, and I think better, is a, a cataract extraction, like Mike said. So getting that right staging is gonna, again, diverge you down two different paths on how you're gonna treat that patient. Great, and we've got about a minute left in this diagnostic part. I bet we go for a minute and a half. I, Lori, I'd like you in about 45 seconds to say, okay, I'm getting visual fields. How do I know if they're really getting worse? Tough, tough, tough. Um, I think I like to have a kind of cor corroborating data. So if their OCT is looking worse, if their pressures are, in my opinion, out of control, that makes me feel a lot more comfortable. I think you'll never be uh, judged for having a patient back to repeat the field just to give yourself and the patient some reassurance that you're making the right next step. Great, so I, I feel the same way. If I'm gonna cut a hole in somebody's eye, um, I better make sure that it's not because I just they just had a bad day on a visual field. It's a very artistic test. I agree with you that it's the most important because it is the one where the rubber meets the road and the function of a patient in their life isn't dictated by their OCT or their gonioscopy is dictated by their visual field. Justin, same thing with OCT. How do you give us some tips for making sure that when we're seeing progression on OCT, it's real? and how you correlate that with visual field. And then we're gonna move on to treatments. Yeah, I think, you know, repeatability is a big thing. A lot of these guided progression analysis pieces help a lot to be able to look at multiple fields on a trend line. Uh, I think with an OCT, it's important not to get caught up in looking at color. Uh, it's very easy to look at the color of an OCT and say, oh, green means normal. And you'll have patients that are progressing right, you know, in front of you with what we call green disease, where that RNFL, those values are declining. Uh, right in front of you, but they're staying green. And so pay attention to the values, look at the look at the numbers, and then pay attention to the eyes. They should be uh, fairly equal on numbers. You know, just like we look at CD ratio, if you have a 0.5 cup in one eye and a 0.7 in the other, that's a red flag. If you have a 83 average RNFL in one eye and a 93 in the other eye, that's a red flag to me. So those are things that you just want to pay attention to. Great news. I don't pay attention to colors at all because I'm colorblind. Red and green looks the same to me. So give me the numbers, baby.